in order to understand human origins, you have to understand the origin of our own solar system and the general manner in which solar systems like ours are formed up in our galaxy. And that picture has changed quite a lot in the last several decades. Our schools still teach a gravity-only cosmology. We're taught that gravity alone governs most of what we see in the universe, that gravity holds galaxies together, that it forms solar systems like ours up from swirling masses of solar material. And, of course, gravity doesn't have the power to hold a galaxy together. There's not enough mass in the typical galaxy. They end up inventing things, dark matter, dark energy, which have never really been seen, to try to make that system work. Um, what we're coming up with in real life is quite a lot different from that. Um, in real life, gravity is by 40 orders of magnitude the weakest force in nature. Asking gravity to hold a galaxy together is like asking the littlest kid in the school to do the powerlifting event. Now, in real life, what we're coming up with is that 99.9 um, .9 something percent of the mass of the universe is in plasma form. This is this fourth state of matter which you've read about, an electrically dissociated state. Uh, and this is the general nature of the universe. This is spread out everywhere. You get charge separation over immense regions of space in, in this plasma, and because of the charge separation, you get electrical currents arcing over huge regions of space, and these are called Birkeland currents, and more often than not, they take the form of twisted pairs of current, like a helix or like a, a DNA RNA spiral. And these twisted pairs of currents have electromagnetic pinch points, which are called Z-pinch or Z-pinch points, and these Z-pinch points have more than enough power to agglomerate plasma into solid objects, which could be stars, which could be protoplanets, which could be solar systems like ours, which could be galaxies, right, at the largest possible scale. You get what are called strings of galaxies. Now, a string of galaxies would be completely impossible in a gravity-only cosmology. I mean, there's no rational way to explain how gravity could create a thing like that. Um, these things end up looking like beads on a string, you know, and very often the strings of galaxies that you see retain the helical form of the Birkeland current which created them. On a smaller scale, you get what are called herbig harrow objects, and these are proto-solar systems. These are, again, they look like beads on a string. You've got like a, a Birkeland current and at the Z pinch points of the Birkeland current, you get protostars or stars, planets. And these things are not rotational systems like our own solar system. These are axially aligned systems. Again, they look like beads on a string which has been stretched taut. And, you know, these things eventually devolve into rotating systems like our present solar system. They don't really last that terribly long. I've read, you know, like several thousand couple of tens of thousands of years, but not millions of billions of years or anything like that. So that a herbic harrow object, or I prefer to use the term herbic harrow object string, is a temporary arrangement of things. Nonetheless, there's every reason to believe that our own solar system was, was in a form like that not very long ago, a few tens of thousands or a couple of hundred thousand years ago. If you were to believe that our solar system had formed up the way that you've heard in school as a rotating disk of solar material being formed into clumps or any normal kind of way, really. It's like you would have to believe that the spin axes of the planets would all be roughly perpendicular to the plane of the solar system itself. Um, and it isn't. You've got the Sun and Mercury and Jupiter, which all do sort of look like that. In other words, the spin axes or the axis tilts of the Sun and Mercury and Jupiter all less than 10 degrees. So that you would assume that those three things were either an original, either the way the system looked originally or, or the way that the system looked shortly after the original herbic harrow string had broken up, right? You've got two planets with very strange orbital um, axis tilts, which are Venus and Uranus. Venus is completely upside down, spins retrograde to the system. 
Uranus is like about 97 degrees, it's laid over on one side. Each of those two bodies has its own special story. But the thing which is interesting is that you've got the other four main planets, which are Neptune, Saturn, Mars, and Earth, which all have this roughly 26 degree axis tilt. Okay, I would think it ranges from about 24 to 28 degrees. And, you know, visually it looks the same. It's like, you know, if you draw a picture of the thing, well, or, or, or artist conception of the thing, it's going to all look like they're sitting there, leaned over at the same angle. And the obvious implication of this is that these four bodies were captured by the Sun, Jupiter, Mercury system at some later date as a group, right? In other words, that at some very recent point, they were still sitting there looking like part of an original Herbig Harrow string. And they simply flew into the, ultimately, flew into the plane of the sun solar system from the south at a 26 degree angle. And as the individual bodies peeled out and began to rotate around the sun, revolve around the sun the way that they do now, they simply kept the 26 degree angle. Uh, and that pretty much is logically coherent. I mean, that, that, that's what you would expect. Um, what does this tell us about our solar system 50, 60, 100,000 years ago? What it tells us is that the system was in two parts and that there was a very bright part and there was a very dark part. And the bright part says that you've got actually the normal thing in our galaxy is for gas giant planets like Jupiter or Saturn to be orbiting quite a bit closer to the main sequence stars with the orbit than Jupiter and Saturn do now. So that you know, missing the other four planets and possibly Venus and Uranus as well, then you've got a likelihood that Jupiter is going to be orbiting our sun within the habitable zone. And particularly in the case of these four large moons of Jupiter, you've got a situation where they're getting radiant energy both from Jupiter, from the dark star or, or dwarf star, and from the sun, right? So that you've got a potentially habitable situation sitting there at least in the case of Ganymede, the largest of the four Galilean moons of Jupiter. You have a situation where you have to at least think in terms of something being habitable. Um, <clears throat> this would be a very bright world. Like I said, the, the, there's, no, the, the, there's no lack of light coming both from the Sun and from Jupiter. On the other side of the thing, you've got a very dark kind of a world. You know, I don't want to use the term orbiting, right, because it's still like... A, an electrically aligned system is not an orbital system, but you've got Neptune and Saturn, Mars and Earth. And in the case of Mars and Earth, these bodies would have been within the heliosphere of Saturn, which at that time was a dwarf star. So that you have, you know, basically radiant energy bouncing off of the heliosphere of the plasma sheath of, of the dark star and back to the rocky bodies from every which direction, right? So you've got enough radiant energy, you're not going to freeze to death. But the entire middle part of the light spectrum is gone, I mean, it just isn't there. But you have a deep purple kind of a world, which is the, 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 the purple dawn, which ancient, you know, the oldest kinds of mythology books talk about. And the creatures of this world or adapted to that kind of a world. They all have these same gigantic eyes, you know, hominid and Neanderthal eye sockets, quite a, quite a bit larger than ours, They're very big. You know, that's the most major thing that you notice in Danny Bendermini's Neanderthal reconstructions, the eyes just sort of jump out at you. It's just a fabulously bug-eyed sort of a creature. Dinosaurs, same thing. All of the dinosaurs, even the herbivores, even the flying dinosaurs, all have these same huge eyes. And we actually have a number of creatures left over from that age lemurs, tarsiers, bush babies, owl monkeys, which have those same kinds of eyes. This is what you would expect of a creature walking around in a world where the middle part of the light spectrum just wasn't there. I mean, a deep, dark, purple sort of a world. And humans and dolphins have the smallest relative eye size of any advanced creatures. There's no way to believe that humans would have come from a world like this. The humans have to have come from the bright part of the thing. Now, that's the first requirement for a human home world. In other words, you know, neither evolution nor God is going to create a creature for, which would be hideously ill-adapted to his home world. You know, that, that doesn't really work. You, you have to believe that any creature you ever find in the universe is going to be adapted to 
whatever world he grew up on or, or, or his home world, right? There are three major requirements that we come up with as far as, uh, you know, what you would expect from a human original world, uh, you know, some kind of world in which humans could live without technology. I and mean, humans live on this planet only by dent of technology. That's always been the case no matter how far back you go into prehistory, right? But at some point, I mean, when humans first arose in our system, it had to have been a situation in which we lived without all the technology. And that brings up the question is what do you need for, for a world like that? Here's what we come up with. Um, an original human home world would have to have been bright. Okay? It would have to have been wet. Humans are primarily adapted to an aquatic environment where, where quasi-aquatic creatures, and neither Troy nor myself believe in evolution or have any use for it. Um, you know, there's two ways you could look at Elaine Morgan's aquatic ape thesis. You could either look at it as a version of evolution, which we have no use for it. You could look at it as a theory of human adaptation, which is believable enough, right? In other words, Elaine Morgan's aquatic ape idea is probably the best version of human, human adaptation which has ever been put forward. It's never gotten any traction in academia. And there are two reasons for this. It's like, number one is that the, there's no evidence of it, no fossil evidence of any sort of an aquatic ape has ever been found. But the bigger reason is that there's never been a body of water on this planet which would be safe for humans to live in on a full-time basis. You only need to spend 15 minutes in the ancient sea monster section of the Smithsonian Museum to comprehend why humans have never lived in water on this planet, particularly 50 or 60,000 years ago. Um, nonetheless, it's like, as Elaine Morgan notes, what we share a hundred different characteristics with the aquatic mammals. The most obvious difference between us and monkeys and apes is having the legs be the major limbs. I mean, all monkeys and apes' arms are the major limbs. A monkey trying to swim the way that we do would probably just turn somersaults in the water. Voluntary control over breathing, that's another adaptation for swimming and diving. We take that for granted. Monkeys and apes don't have it, um, and that's the only reason they can't teach chimpanzees or gorillas to speak English. They can learn deaf science perfectly well, and some of the ones that they've taught deaf science check out as having IQs in the 90 to 105 range. That's adequate for half the jobs in the world. The way the human body uses fat is entirely the, the, the same manner in which the, the bodies of aquatic mammals use fat. You, you know, you don't see that with land animals. There, there's a question of a sense of smell. No, particularly no land prey animal without a sense of smell would survive more than a couple of weeks. Whereas a sense of smell is not, is not really necessary for an aquatic mammal. You, you know, that, that makes sense. Face-to-face um, -face sex. We humans do that, aquatic mammals do that, land animals generally don't do that. So you've got a whole list of things, right? And like I said, the, the evidence indicates that, um, uh, you know, that humans are basically quasi-aquatic creatures, but there's simply no way to believe that we ever could have lived as a quasi-aquatic or fully aquatic creature on this planet, in other words, Elaine Morgan's theory works perfectly well. It just needs another planet in order to, to work on. So that this is the second requirement that you have for a human, a human original world, a home world. It, it has to be bright. It has to be wet. And, you know, the third requirement it has to be safe, both from cosmic radiation and from sea monsters. I mean, there, there can't be any stingrays, any sharks, there can't be any poisonous snakes in the water, there can't be piranhas, there can't be, you know, any of the things which, you know, humans have no adaptation to deal with without technology that just couldn't be there. Um, cosmic radiation, whatever the home body uh, of modern humans w would have been, it would have to be safe from cosmic radiation, and that generally means an intrinsic magnetosphere, and there are only two bodies in our system, rocky bodies, that still have intrinsic magnetospheres, and that would be the Earth and Jupiter's largest moon, which is Ganymede. Okay, these are the three things that you need. An original home, home world, for an original home world for humans has to, be, has to be bright, it has to be wet, and it has to be safe. 
Um, when I first came up with this, then, you know, I was working with Troy McLaughlin in the beginnings of a book which ultimately became Cosmos and Collision. And I said, Troy, you know what I've come up with. I mean, you, you know, you can look at this thing with um, hominids and with dinosaurs and their eyes, and, you know, you, you can see that humans simply could not have come from this dark side of our original solar system. They have to come from the bright side. And it didn't occur to me at that time there was anything still remaining which would be a plausible candidate for that. It was, I was assuming that, you know, what you were probably talking about was some kind of a, another body which had since been blown up or disappeared somehow or other. You know, it, we didn't really quite know what to expect. Troy went into an investigation of Ganymede thinking that at any time, you know, the first minute the whole thing looked like trying to pound a square peg into a round hole or trying to force something, he was going to bail. But he tells me that the, the further he got into this, he says that nothing ever began to look fake or look wrong. He said, he said everything started to fall into place of its own volition. In other words, sort of like what chess grandmasters call a game which plays itself. In other words, you know, he, he told me that he was just completely astounded at the, at the manner in which this whole thing came together by itself. It turns out that Ganymede has everything that you would need, or, or at least 50 or 60,000 years had everything that you would need for an original human home world.